Well, good evening. Had a powerful morning this morning. Um, at the Chrism Mass, and at the Chrism Mass, we uh, we renewed our vows, all the priestly promises that we made at our ordination, you might say. Been a priest for 18 years. I have been at 18 of those chrism masses. I don't think I ever saw this line. There's a line. It talks about um, committing and responding to God, and it says, you promise out of love for Christ I didn't get past that I have no idea what I committed to because <laughs> I, I couldn't get past that line you promise out of love for Christ. Later on, during the Mass this morning, I was laughing. I said, Jesus, I have no idea what I recommitted to. And he said, you recommitted to a person, not to a thing. He said, you recommitted to a person. was uh, just blown away this morning with how much I love him with how much he loves me I was thinking about 18 years of priesthood and Think about the first time I saw you. First week in the Advent in 2015. I remember falling in love with you also. Tonight is about a person who is madly in love with us. Amen? Love is not a feeling. Love is not convenient. For those of you who are married, you know what, that's, what that means. It's a decision. It's a, a verb. It's something you do. Love. What is love? Love is when you empty yourself into the other. Let me say that again. Love is when you empty yourself into another. Let's say that together. Ready? Love is when you empty yourself into another. One more time. Love is when you empty yourself into another. Let me give you an example. I'm going to give you an example because I know he loves it when I call on, on him during the homily. So, Father Bryce, you come on over here. I think the last time I, we, we gave a homily together, I, I threw a fishing lure at you. I promise not to do that tonight, okay? <laughs> Just very, very quickly. We know that God is love. Amen? And like he, he, God, is, God, is, God is love. It's not what he does. It's who he is. God is the standard of love, not America or not emotion or not Hollywood. God is love. And we know that there is a we in God. Amen? There's a Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you didn't know that, see me after Mass. we got some other things we got to catch you up on, all right? So just for the sake of the example, the Father is forever loving the Son, right? We know that, right? 
If God is love, that means the source of all love, the Father, is forever loving the Son. We know that in Scripture because it says, he who has no hair is always loving he who has hair, right? (laughs) It's in some ancient manuscript. He told me that the other day when he was chanting in the house in Hebrew. He said, hey, did you know? No, that wasn't there, (laughs) right? So the Father for all eternity is loving the Son. But we know that love is most love when it's not all contained in you, but when it's expressed, when it's poured out into another. Amen? That makes sense, right? You know that as a married couple or as a mama or a daddy or an aunt or an uncle, you see that, right? Love is something that might start within us, but it's most love when we pour that into another, right? So the Father, for all eternity, is pouring his love into the Son. What's the Son doing? He's receiving that love all day long, right? So for all eternity, even before Jesus took on flesh, the Father is pouring his love into the Son, and the Son is just receiving that love. Amen? And the bond between the Father and the Son is called the Holy Spirit, right? So that's what it is. Fine job, son. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> Can't wait till you become flesh and do something on Holy Thursday. Get on over there, all right? <laughs> so for all eternity, the Father is pouring himself into the Son. To love is to pour, to empty your, yourself, your, your heart into another. And that's what's happening tonight. I think that's what I got I got swept up in at Mass this morning. I don't deserve that. I don't. But God, he loves me anyway. I came face to face with why I said yes to begin with. Why I'm here tonight and what tonight's all about. It's about love. Amen? Now, I have never understood washing of feet. I've got to be honest with you. I, I didn't have good scripture teaching when I was in the seminary. I've got to be honest with you. I repent, Dr. Petrie. I didn't really pay attention at all in seminary. Um, <laughs> you could have been in. I wouldn't have paid attention. <laughs> I, I didn't pay attention. I, I was immature. I was, I was just in a different space in life. And, I never understood washing feet. I didn't understand. It didn't make sense. And it was always presented to me in, in language that I didn't really get and understand. And tonight, I want us together as a family to fall in love with something that's in the Bible that maybe we've never fallen in love with before. So how about we do that together? Can we tonight let the Father draw us into the Last Supper with what he was doing in the washing of the feet. I think you have some homily notes somewhere in a bulletin or maybe descending in the form of a dove or something like that. I think you have some homily notes. And I'd like to just do a little teaching, just have a little conversation with you tonight so that we can can embrace the washing of the feet together. If you go with me to number one, does everybody have the notes there? Go with me to number one. Today's often called Monday Thursday, which uh, just as some fancy words just means that we have a mandate. We've been given this mandate in the gospel today, and the mandate is number two. We have been given a commandment to love. What's happening tonight is about love. What's happening tonight is all about love and the washing of the feet in the institution of the Eucharist, in the garden, through midnight as he's on trial, as he's scourged at the pillar, as he's on the cross, it's all about love. And we see this in some beautiful images, which to be honest with you, I don't think I ever really got before. And now that I, I've received them, I'm just kind of like wrapping my mind around it. Go with me to, to, to number three, right? The first thing that we want to understand tonight is a biblical understanding of what it means to empty. That's a, that's a really awesome word. It's called kenosis. Say that with me. 
kenosis. The word kenosis means to empty yourself, right? To empty. And if love is when we empty into the other, when we give everything to the other, then that's what's happening tonight. I'm going to read this, and I want you to follow along with me. This comes from Philippians number 3. Have among yourselves the same attitude that is also yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness, and found human in appearance. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name of, that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let the church say amen. When does God empty himself? If to love is to empty, if to love is kenosis, when does God empty himself? First time he empties himself is when he empties himself in the incarnation. That's Christmas. He empties himself right here in Philippians, taking the form of a human being, not just any human being, but the lowest of human beings, a slave. When's the next time he empties himself? On the cross, as he pours out everything on the cross. And in the washing of the feet. Now you might be saying to yourself, Father Mark, I understood the first two, but I don't understand how he's emptying himself in the washing of the feet. Well, that, my friends, is our awesome story tonight. Now, there's going to be three images that I want us to wrap our minds around tonight as we enter into the washing of the feet. You ready? The first is going to be the garments. The second image that we are going to wrap our minds around tonight is the image of a washing, and the third is the feet. I want you to hold on to the story now. You ready? The garments, the washing, and the feet. The garments, the washing, and the feet. Look at number six. In the incarnation, God takes off the garments of glory, you might say, and puts on the garments of humanity. Right, Rather, he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave coming in human likeness. Not only does God take off the garments of, take on the garments of humanity, but notice he takes on the garments of the lowest of humans, which is that of a slave. That's what Philippians is saying, right? So these garments, God takes off the garments of glory in the incarnation and takes garments, you might say, of the lowest of all human beings, a slave. In the resurrection, number seven, God puts back on the garments of glory. Jesus' garments were obviously um, there in the tomb. His resur- in his resurrection, Jesus did not put on the linen garments. He puts on the garments of glory now in his glorified body, right? We're all going to have a body in heaven, and I swear to God, I'm going to be 21 all over again, right? <laughs> Pick your age and just tell God, whatever glorified body you want, right there, right? Number eight, at the Last Supper, Jesus wears both garments, the garments of humanity, furthermore, the garments of slavery, and the garments of glory, pointing to his resurrection. We're going to unfold that for you together, all right? Now, it says in tonight's gospel, number nine, fully aware that the Father had put everything into his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God, he rose from supper and took off his outer garments. Now, to us, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But in the mind of a first century Jewish person, in the mind of Peter, in the mind of John, that would have automatically elicited from them something very particular. To take off your garments. The only people who would take off their garments, right, and gird themselves, right, the way that Jesus did, were those who would have put a towel around their waist and would have served. Look at number 10, right? Slaves were the only ones who would take a towel and tie it around their waist. Those who had slaves, it would be the slaves who would serve them in that regard. And the image that the slave was ready to serve the master was when 
the slave would take off his garments and wrap the towel around the waist because he's only doing one thing with that towel. He's going to wash the feet of his master and he's going to dry the feet of his master with that towel. We see that in Luke 12. Look at that, that, that third bullet there right there. It says, gird your loins and light your lamps and be like what? Servants who await their master's return from a wedding, ready to open immediately when he comes and knocks. Right? So there's this image throughout Scripture. There's this image that obviously all of the apostles in the upper room would have known. So when they see Jesus taking off his garments and girding himself with a towel, he is signaling to them something that is like kind of like blowing their mind that he is going to be their slave. He is going to be the one who serves them like a slave, right? Look at number 11 from tonight's gospel. He came to Simon Peter. He said, Master, are you going to wash my feet? Wait, wait a second. I'm not sure if you can wash my feet. Peter knows that the imagery of the garments is sending a signal to the apostles that Jesus is not serving them like the master. He's serving them like one who serves as a slave. Peter knows this, and that's why Peter kind of pushes back a little bit. He says, you're looking like one who serves like a slave. You're not my slave. You can just feel like Peter pushing back as Jesus wears this, this imagery, these garments of, of a slave. Now, what's going to happen in this relationship as a slave? There's going to be some washing. But I want us to go deeper tonight. All that we see in the washing of the feet is a pre-enactment of the passion. Let me say that again. You ready? All that we see in the washing of the feet is a pre-enactment of the passion. So if you want to understand the passion, you can look deep into the washing of the feet, and it's going to reveal things about Jesus' passion. Number 12, Jesus pours water into a basin and begins to wash the disciples' feet. Right, And then there's some scripture passages that are from tonight's gospel. Right, Number 13, P- Peter says, I don't know... Under- I- I don't understand what you're doing. Jesus says, you'll understand later. He also says, number 14, unless I wash you, you have no inheritance with me. Then, number 15, from verses 9 to 11, Jesus makes this interesting comment about those who have already bathed don't need to be, to be washed and cleaned all over again, right? So let's, under, let's unpack this a little bit. Number 16, it says that he poured water into a basin when else on this night of all night is jesus going to pour that which cleanses when tonight is jesus going to pour into that which cleanses look at number 16 from matthew and he took a cup and when he had given thanks he said to them saying drink of it all of you let's read the rest of this sentence together you ready For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. As Jesus is pouring water, it brings us into the reality that his blood will be poured over humanity, not to cleanse us of the dirt along the path, but to cleanse us of our sins. As Jesus is serving the disciples at the Last Supper, pouring that water, it, it, it is bringing them into a reality that he's going to pour out his blood over all the world to cleanse all of us of our sins. Number 17. When are they going to understand later? After the passion, after the resurrection, probably at Pentecost, as they're looking back on it all, that's when it'll all make sense because all those things have to happen in order for what happens in the washing of the feet to actually make sense. Now, number 18, this is fascinating. He says, unless I wash you, you will have no inheritance with me. Why does Jesus say that? He says two things that are, that are fascinating. He says, unless I wash you, you will not have the inheritance with me. 
I have to be honest with you and say that as, as I've read this so many times in the past, it just kind of flew over my head and didn't understand it. But if what happens in the washing of the feet is a pre-enactment of the passion, if you can understand the passion through the washing of the feet, now look at the first bullet on number 18. To wash. From 1 Corinthians chapter 6. That is what some of you used to be, but now you have had yourselves washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of God. When are we washed? You might say, well, not only at baptism, right? But even before that, we together are washed tonight. What's happening tonight in the garden, the yes, tomorrow. What's happening tomorrow on the cross, Jesus is washing us. Why? So that we can have everlasting life. And I don't know about you, but what I tasted this morning at the chrism mass is I want to get to heaven. And the only way I'm getting to heaven is through Jesus, who I love. Look at the second bullet. This inheritance, right? For this reason, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant since a death has taken place for the deliverance of, from transgressions under the first covenant, those who were called to receive the promised eternal inheritance, right? The gift of everlasting life. When is that going to happen? That's going to happen in the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I was fascinated to learn that there's this, Jesus says, okay, well, some of you are taking a bath already, but, but you still need to be cleansed, but not all of you, because not all of you are clean. What's he getting at there? As if we go deeper into the washing of the feet, what we see is this. When are we washed once and for all, and that washing cannot be repeated? In baptism. We are washed in baptism, and that washing cannot be repeated. It doesn't need to be repeated. However, when are we washed as often as we need it? In the sacrament of reconciliation, absolutely. We are washed as often as we need to. So Jesus, as he's washing feet, the third image that we wrap our minds around, right, kind of points us into that. Every first century Jewish person, Peter included, John included, Jesus included, all of them, what is the dirtiest part of the body in the first century Judaism? The foot. Why? Because the, the roads are dusty and you're wearing sandals and, and that's, where the, that's where the muck is. And if all day long you're walking outside and, and, and that's literally where the muck and the filth is, imagine what your feet look like. Your, your garments can be beautiful, your, your head can be beautiful, your hands can be cleansed, but at the end of a day of a lot of travel, when you're walking on the journey of life, what is the part of the body that's going to get soiled and dirty? The feet. So Jesus washes feet as an image of cleansing us from sin. So, it all comes together here. If in the washing of the feet, Jesus is pre the passion, Jesus is serving all of humanity in that moment, in the Last Supper, Right? taking on the garments of a slave as one who serves, washing the filth from their feet, but pouring out his blood on all of humanity on the cross so that you and I might be cleansed of sin. Jesus is not doing this on any other, it's not like he's doing this three months before the Last Supper, it's not like he's doing this a year before the Last Supper, he is connecting the washing of the feet with not only his cross, but since the cross is connected to the Last Supper, he's doing it at the Last Supper. So he's looking at the apostles and says, okay, before we move into this Passover meal, I'm going to wash your feet. He's also saying, before we move into the new Passover meal, the Eucharist, we need to be cleansed of sin. The washing of the feet, of all things to wash, of all times to do it, gives us a way to look at the passion of Jesus. Amen?
Now, I got ugly feet. I don't know about you. Actually, I see some of you wearing sandals. Some of you have pretty feet. Feet. Kind of a, not like touching somebody's hand, right? That's why I'm quite sure when somebody came up to you last and said, hey, can I rub your feet? You got to trust a person to have them rub your feet. Amen? Somebody says, hey, I want to rub your head. You're like, awesome. Somebody says, I want to rub your hands. Like, go get them. Somebody says, I want to rub your feet. You're like, who are you? Right? You got to know somebody to rub your feet. It's a vulnerable thing, right? I mean, some of us like our feet. Some of us don't like our feet. Some of the things about our feet, some of us like. I got bunions and scars and calluses on my feet, right? I don't have them on my hands. When you let someone rub your feet, wash your feet, touch your feet, it's a vulnerable position. Amen? Especially if your feet are dirty. Like really dirty. You you let somebody get into your feet You have to trust them, right? You have to take a risk to be vulnerable, right? And the person washing your feet has to be a person of profound humility and holiness. And if biblically, the reason why Jesus is washing feet tonight is to bring us into his passion, then that means that tonight all of us are invited to invite God into perhaps some of the most vulnerable places of our life. Tonight, is about a love affair between a God who is madly in love with us. So much so that he poured himself, taking off the garments of glory into humanity to be one of us that we could see him and touch him and feel him. Amen? That God who so pursues us would actually go inside the darkest moments of my life and your life. Unafraid of our sin, unafraid of what we have done, he would go in there to rescue us. Imaged in this washing of feet. And tonight, ready? In the Eucharist is pouring himself into the garments of bread and wine so that he can pour himself into your body tonight. And I wept at the cursed mass at that kind of God. I don't know where you are in your relationship with God, but you are obviously hungry enough to come here tonight. Tonight, as a father who loves you, I want to invite you tonight into experiencing, watching, beholding the washing of feet in a way that we've never done before. I'm fully aware that in the past we've washed hands and feet. And tonight we're going to fast from the washing of hands. Why? Because I want to draw us in as a father who loves you into washing feet so that we can know what Jesus is doing. Amen? And as we wash those feet, I want us to consider who 
it is who's washing Jesus. What he's touching are sin. Why he's touching it? Because he's madly in love with you. Tonight, I encourage you, as he wants to empty himself into you, just to be wide open to whatever God wants for you. I said something dangerous at Mass this morning. I wanted to take it back as soon as it came out of my mouth. I was looking at Jesus, and I was like, I love you. And I said to him, I said, I'll do whatever you ask of me. And as soon as it came out of my mouth, I'm like, oh, no. But I'm in it. And as one who loves you, I pray that we could all say that together tonight. Amen.